Hello and welcome to this week's very exciting episode of the Benmark Photography Podcast. Today I'm interviewing a very good friend of mine, Adam Haley, who started off just as on the gym floor. He was actually my first personal trainer and got me into the best shape I've ever been in. He then transferred up to London, started working very long shifts for some very high-end clients, learned all of the skills and all of the bits of the trade that he needed to learn before successfully moving into his own online, own online coaching platform and now successfully helping loads and loads of coaches around the world to improve their business and make more money. It's going to be a great episode for you, a real insight into who Adam is, what he does and how he operates. Um, I hope you guys enjoy this. This obviously wouldn't be possible without the help of the photography coach who sponsors this. Uh, it's where you get accountability and also improve your photography to get you to the point of being able to book your own jobs set your own prices and actually live the life as a photographer that you want to live. If you want any more information on that, click on the Benmark Photography website and click the coaching and workshops for more information. But now I'm going to hand you over and introduce you to today's guest, Adam Haley. Thank you. So, oh no, over to you. I was going to go straight into it. <laughs> you, I was ready. ready. I was ready and waiting. Um, so, Adam, tell me a little bit about yourself. So, <laughs> just... If you get that background background noise there, that's not me farting. That's the <laughs> chair that I'm sat on uh, that may happen infrequently throughout the podcast. Um, so Ben's introduced me. My name's obviously Adam Haley. Uh, I was a personal trainer uh, in person for about 11 years. That's where I met Ben. Uh, Ben's now progressed sort of through through his career and I've, I've gone down a different route uh, with mine. So we'll, we'll come to what I do at the moment, but essentially was a personal trainer, now an online coach. I have another business in the works. Um, and basically, I'm a, I'm a laptop wanker. <laughs> Good and honest. Um, so, how long have you been into fitness and what got you into personal training? Okay, so in terms of fitness, if we define that as just sort of like activity uh, and sport, ever since I can remember. So, when I was younger, I would be doing boxing, rugby, football, you name it, back at school. And then when I was uh, about 14, I was getting pain below my kneecaps and I went to the doctors about it. It turns out I had something called Osgood Schlatter's disease, which is apparently relatively normal and it's sort of an overuse of the quadriceps. Um, so I went through that. The doctor said to me, actually, we're not too fussed about that. Like it's relatively uh, common in sort of athletes and stuff and young, young sort of athletes. Um, what we're worried about is we can see on your x-rays that your, uh, fibula is growing faster than your tibia so you've got both legs basically which we couldn't see visually but if I'd left it over time I would have gone over on my ankles so what they suggested was that we uh, perform like an operation to try and correct it so I end up having both legs surgically broken I had a wedge of bone taken out of each uh, shin bone a bigger wedge of fake bone in and then pinned and plated up I was in a wheelchair non-weight bearing for eight weeks um, and when I came out of it, I couldn't walk, you know, it was like Bambi on ice. Uh, my legs were tiny, I had no strength, and I couldn't go back to running and playing football and rugby and whatnot. So I decided, right, if I can't uh, do those sorts of sports, I need something that mentally kind of stimulates me. So the gym was the logical step because I needed to regrow muscle tissue in my thighs and I needed to strengthen them to be able to walk again. So I went, uh, I just sat there, so I, I must have been like 15 at this point, 15 and a half. And I thought, right, who are the best people that put on muscle tissue? It's bodybuilders. Of course, I took that, that, you know, back then they were freaks. Now it's a bit more accepted because of bikini and physique. Uh, but back then, you know, bodybuilders were looked at as freaks. Uh, but I went to WH Smith's and I bought Flex Magazine. I started following sort of the, the workout splits in there. I had really good results. You know, the size came back on my thighs. I was a lot stronger. I started having my friends at school ask me if I could help them add muscle tissue. And ultimately that's what then segued me into becoming a PT is I hit about 16. Uh, I was never very academic. So I left school and I was kind of the youngest person to sit on the level two fitness instructors course and just thought, right, you know, I may not ever be rich out of this, but I don't want to be one of those people that does like an, an office job nine to five and wakes up on Monday morning thinking, fuck, it's Monday. Yeah. I want to be able to get up and impact people uh, exactly. and have fulfillment. Uh, so that's that's how I got into PTing. Cool. And so from that, um, going back now, obviously you've had, what, 10, 15 years? Uh, tw coming up to 13 years. 13 yeah. years. If you could go back to when you first started, what would you do differently? Or uh, 
what would you change with the knowledge now you've become more successful with it? Do you know what? It's actually, um, I don't want this to sound arrogant, but in terms of nutrition and training, I really wouldn't change much. Um, I think sort of, you know, I just learned progressively. I learned from the right people. I was able to to hire people like back in the day, sort of Lane Norton. Uh, I did consults with Phil Lerney, Skip Hill, Dave Palumbo. I did. I was around really good people, sort of all throughout uh, the end, sort of uh, my my career. So there's not a lot I would change from that. What I would change is that I would have got my head away from the bullshit. I just want to help people. I'm not a salesman. No matter what job you do, there's always going to be an element of sales involved. Yep. And I think a lot of personal trainers are just so focused on not wanting to take money from their clients and feeling bad from it and feeling like almost like car salesmen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's not the case. Like truly, if, if you know that you've got a, a service that you could help somebody with, or you're an expert in that field, somebody wants to lose weight, for example, you, you yeah, know you're going to get yeah. great images for people. So the view now that I take and that I wish if I could go back in time, the one thing that I would change, I wish I had the mindset of, I'm not selling to somebody, like I'm I'm doing a, ser- a swap, there's a transaction that's going on here. And that if I'm too afraid to, to do that and, and to sell to somebody, if, if you wanna call it sales, then I'm actually doing them a disservice. Yeah. Because I know that I'm the best person for the job. And if they're in the market, this is back then, if they're in the market for a personal trainer, and I, I couldn't look them in the eye and sell them confidently, they're going to go and spend that money with somebody else. And I, I, you know, I was confident, right? I could get people results. Like, you know, you're evidence of that. Um, but I just had this innate fear of selling and, and I I see it a lot in trainers. It's a hard one, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, for example, you know, a local trainer could say, somebody could approach them, uh, how much do you charge for personal training? And it would be, uh, so I charge 35 pounds an hour, but if you sign up now, do it for 25. And, I, and I'll throw in a free nutrition plan. And it's like, just shut the fuck up. Just yeah, be confident. Yeah, yeah. Look somebody in the eye and go, I charge 35 pounds an hour. So scared to actually be proud of what they do. Yeah, you're service. worth it. Like, like if, yeah. if you can genuinely sit back and think, can I deliver the service this person is paying for? Am I worth that money? Am I worth that 35 pounds an hour? Am I going to give them results for that? If the answer is yes, then just look them in the eye. Have confidence in, you know, in your, yourself and you'll have no issues. Coming from an area where I was your client, yeah. you you don't realize it at the time but you look up to that area of like confidence in someone you see that absolutely they can deliver something so it makes you want to actually be more like that and that's why probably like personal trainers do get quite friendly with their clients because you actually like take on board like you mm-hmm. say when you're around the good people that you should be around or like the people that you want to be around yeah they raise you up so if your personal trainer is good and they're worth what they are it'll raise your value and then that has a knock-on effect in your life absolutely so yeah, to any trainers listening to this, come away from the thought process of, I just want to help people. Sure, we d- we get into this because we want to help people, we want to impact people and get them results, but ultimately you need to put food on the table, right? Yep. We're not doing this to be a charity. What's been your biggest mental hurdle that you've had to overcome to get to where you are today? Um, again, it's one that is, I, I think a lot of people go through it. It's like that whole imposter syndrome so it's sort of questioning, like, am I good enough? Um, you know, do I put myself out there and, and this and that, which at the beginning, when I first ever started training clients, you know, you can't help but sort of question yourself. Um, and then it's more evident across social media. So I always, you know, I've always been confident in, in getting results with people. Um, so that's never been an issue. But nowadays, you know, most of, most trainers and, and your, your marketing, it's, it's all visual stuff, what we do. Um, so Instagram is an amazing platform for it. The problem I see with this whole imposter syndrome that I've been through is I can look a client in the eye and take them on and know that I'm gonna get them a result. But trying to post regularly on social media, you can't help but think, oh, are other trainers gonna criticize this you know am I putting out as good a content as them and you've probably done it yourself where you compare your images to perhaps other photographers that you look up to Um, this is one of my biggest struggles and again you kind of just have to come away from that mindset and think uh, those other trainers or in your case those other photographers they're not the ones putting money in my pocket they're on a different level to me like we have a different target market a different demographic um, and again by me not having the confidence to put content out there, I'm doing 
those people that are on my level and are in, in, in my niche uh, a disservice. Uh, a good quote that I read was, I don't think it's a quote as such, but it was, um, you only need to be one chapter ahead like for you to teach something. So you don't have to be the best personal trainer in the world or the best photographer in the world, but for your target market, are you one chapter ahead of them? Yeah. If the answer is yes, then... And the flip side of that is that there's probably other people out there that look up to you and thinking, wow, actually this guy is like five steps ahead. Yeah, Which absolutely. then adds so much value to you and what you're doing that you can always think the negative, but like mentally, if you can get your head onto that, like actually know like this is good, and even if it helps impact one person, that's that could be a game changer for someone. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, it's just I think it's just the whole social media thing, comparison syndrome, imposter syndrome, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's just easy to get inside your own head and think I'm not good enough. People aren't going to like my contents. So then you, you you hold back from posting, and actually there is a pool of people that really do want to listen to your message. So you you have to get it out there. You've recently <coughs> launched a new training tra uh, trainers training program. Tell tell us more about it. Yeah. So um, essentially, it's kind of it's just the evolution, I guess. Is you know I went from doing all these sports that I mentioned earlier, rugby, football, boxing, and so on, to then gym work, to then PTing. Throughout my PT career, towards the end of it, I was asked to go to certain gyms to go and deliver seminars to other trainers within the industry. I've had trainers reach out to me and ask me to mentor them, which I really enjoyed. Um, so I, I'd been sort of helping people with that and becoming better trainers and getting better results. But then also over the past 18 months to, to two years, my focus has been quite heavily on business. Um, so I, I segued from uh, training clients in person to building an online business with my former business partner, Akash, and the business that was was, was RNT Fitness. Um, since setting that up, like, business became a huge passion and it's an area that a lot of trainers struggle in. So not only do I see trainers sort of not getting great results with their clients, but they also can't generate leads they can't retain clients they can't sell to clients they can't close so um after having quite a few inquiries with this uh, th there's clearly a market for it so i got uh i think it was around may time under the rnt name akash and i decided to set up the rnt academy and uh, we'd, we'd sold it out i'd sold it out within like three days we had to actually extend the amount of spots so i knew there was something there and then back in September, once Akash and I had spoken and said that we we're on you know, slightly separate wavelengths or on a, we need to go uh, different ways, I decided to go all in on the education side of things with trainers. And I've since started putting out more and more content aimed towards other trainers on how to be more productive, how to structure your day, how to sell a client, uh, you know, how to keep people within the business, how to get clients the, the best results in the shortest amount of time, how to help them with eating disorders. Um, loads of different things and the response has been amazing it's literally within the first two weeks of starting to put out this new content and referencing back to the imposter syndrome you know because this was a new style of posting for me you, you can't help but second guess and think you know, am I doing the right thing am I going to come across arrogant have I paid my dues and and I just had to roll with it and think you know yeah I have paid my dues I've been doing this for 13 years I've got results I've built a profitable online business um I am that one chapter ahead. Uh, so luckily I, I started getting DMs from people going, dude, that, this content is amazing, thank you so much. I never looked at this in that light and I never did this and I never did that. So I just finished the first round of the mentorship and uh, people are like doubling, tripling their income uh, uh, and the money that they'd invested in into it, they've made it back within like two weeks. So what I'm trying to do is I'm not trying to compete with I, w I won't actually no I will name them because I'm quite open I'm not trying to compete with uh, the ACA which is the Phil Learney's Advanced Coaching Academy Martin McDonald's uh, MNU they're fantastic courses uh, they're really well built out sort of e-learning platforms very very science based and amazing I'm not trying to compete with that uh, instead I'm trying to come in with more the application side of things that when you've got client X out in front of you this is what you do in the real world so these courses are amazing at teaching you the foundation and the science behind it. I'm coming in with, 
here's client X, here's client Y, here's client Z. This is what I did with them at week one, week two, week three. So there's that element. And then the other side of it is that I see um, a lot of trainers now getting into the industry and learning straight away about sort of Facebook ads, click funnels and so on. I'm just trying to bridge the gap between the two. So I'm teaching people ed uh, application of what to do with clients as well as how to structure uh, an online fitness business. So to just sum it up, it's really, it's aimed for the personal trainer. If you're listening to this and you're a personal trainer that's on the gym floor, you're sick of counting reps and you're sick of being out of the house for like 14 to 16 hours a day. I've been there. Um, my solution was to transition myself away from it, build an online business where I now train my coaches through there. And as you know, Ben, I, I can, I mean, I've sat here doing this with you midday. Yep. Um, I can go on a holiday and just take my laptop with me. And it's, it's really aimed for those. So if you're listening to this and you're fed up of being stuck in a rut, you need more results with clients, you need more clients in the business, you need to retain the ones that you've got and you wanna be able to structure an online business, then that's what the online trainer education is for. It's a nice little plug for like Thank that. you, that's yeah, I thought nice. I'd get it in there. And also like you can see from, I've watched your social media, like I've even commented and told you like, the level of now what you're putting out, mm -hmm. like where you had that imposter, you know, you're like, oh, what's going on here? You can see it, people are looking and going, oh, that's, I didn't know that, or I didn't, yeah. and what's the great thing about social media is you could be anywhere in the world. I've got a coaching client that's in Dubai. Yeah. I don't see him, but yeah, his photography is improving every week. Um, so by having that knowledge and being able to push that out there to people, there's always something you don't know. And exactly. it just means there's other people out there that do know, and they, they've got the answers for you. And if that answer then generates you 10, 20 times whatever you're making before, well, 10, 20 times is probably a little bit too much. That'd be nice. <laughs> two, five times more than what you're making before, then that's the, the price you pay for it. But then you get the answers and you get the results and then your business grows. And that's what you've done with yours. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's exactly that is just learn from people that are a chapter ahead of you. So there's a reason that you know I've invested into guys like Craig Ballantyne, Vince Del Monte and so on, John Goodman. Um, you know, they're at sort of the, the top end of the fitness business. I like to think that, you know, let's be real, just building a six figure business within 12 months places me, you know, somewhere in the middle of the pack, hopefully. Um, and then I, my target is that the guys are, are very new to it. They don't currently have any online clients or they've got a, a small client base. They, they want to level up, you know, they want to take their earnings from maybe three or four grand a month and they want to take it to, you know, six to 10 grand a month. Like that's where I could help them. Perfect. So, give the listeners and viewers some advice on how you manage because obviously we've both done a similar thing where well I say I tr still travel a lot but we work from home you know often get like a whole load of stuff to do like how do you uh, what's some advice you could give to people who work from home and want to stay productive it's hard um, <laughs> like that's that's the truth uh, I think you like you've struggled with this yeah, too right massively. Um, it's it's tough when you've suddenly got this newfound freedom um, it's easy to drag out a job that might take you two, three hours over like six to eight hours. Um, so the first thing I'll point out is that like, I struggled a, a lot. So when I first left it, so my, my whole life had been dictated by my diary. So, you know, I'd have a client at this time, client at this time, eat at this time, client, train at this time. Everything was super rigid. So to go from that for like, uh, probably about 11 and a half years, to then waking up on the first morning of doing online training, like where I went all in on it. It was like, well, I don't have to be up at 4.30 anymore. Screw it, I'll get up at 10, like as long as the work gets done. And then what I found myself doing was just procrastinating massively. I'd be procrastinating and then I'd still be working at like 12 a.m., maybe 1 a.m. Um, and when I'd look back at the day, I'd think, oh, I could have wrapped that up in a few hours. So my big bit of advice, um, and this is from Craig Ballantyne, it's one of the best uh, quotes that, I, that I've been taught, and it's structure equals freedom. It's, yeah. it's huge, it's, it's massive. It's his, one of his favorite quotes, that, one of my favorite quotes of his that he put out there, structure equals freedom. And it really is the case. So when you leave full-time work and you, you go into this laptop lifestyle, you know, you can wake up whenever you want, you can go to bed whenever you want, you can work wherever you want. But it's easy to let that just go to the extreme of just, you know, I'm gonna get up at 10 o'clock and I'll get up at 11, I'll get up at eight, there's just no structure. As soon as I spoke to Craig and I told him I'm really struggling with productivity, 
he was like, right, you need to put a diary together, you need to get structure in place, and suddenly you have a lot more free time. So not only have I done that, it's been a huge game changer, but people on my mentorship, uh, I've tried it with them, and I got a message from one of the guys saying, for the first time ever, this Sunday, I sat on the sofa and I didn't know what to do. He's like, all my jobs were done. I was literally going through my emails, I was going through my to-do lists, everything that usually I'm chasing my tail day after day, everything was in place. I got to Sunday, I was able to spend it with my girlfriend, I was able to go on a dog walk. So the big premise behind it is get a, go old school, get a diary system in place, uh, start with the, the big rocks as we call it, and that would be you know your personal fulfillment stuff. So for me, it's making sure my gym sessions are in. It's downtime, like going to the cinema, things that I enjoy. When I'm in a relationship, it's booking in date night, like make sure it happens. That, that was something that I've put in place, like when I have yeah. been home, and it, it, it makes you feel like you're achieving things. Exactly. That you want to do, and they can be small little things, but they're like, it's massive how much that changes your mindset, and then you're mm -hmm. suddenly like, I'm fired up and ready. Yeah, if, if you just get into that perpetual rut of just, uh, you know, letting the day run away or just work, 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 you'd be pretty miserable. So the first thing you need to do is put the things in your diary, schedule them in, the things that are gonna give you personal fulfillment. And then from there, schedule in like your, your deep work time. So for me, I wouldn't recommend people use my format. My day's a little bit weird in that I tend to work from, so I'll post on social media at 7 a.m. But then I'll work in a coffee shop from 8 a.m. till 12 p.m all my sort of content production and client check-ins. Then from 12 until about three, half three, uh, maybe four, is when I'll train and then I'll have my downtime. So where most people work through the day and in the evening they switch off, they watch TV, they relax. I have that around like two, three, four p.m. is when I will sit on the sofa and watch Netflix. And then I start work again at later evening. This just suits me, I'm not suggesting this, yep. but just having it blocked out in my diary. So I know from eight till 12, I'm working, 12 till four is just sort of whatever I want. It's small jobs, replying to people on Instagram and so on, uh, and just being able to relax if I want and do these sorts of things. Like I'm meeting up with you at this time and it's what, 25 past two. Um, but then from about six, 7 p.m. onwards until maybe like 10, 11 at night, I'll be working again. This, that just works for me, it's when I'm productive. The key was working out when I'm productive which for, for me is like, I know that mid-afternoon I'm terrible. So for me, it doesn't make sense to try and work mid-afternoon. I know that I'm productive first thing in the morning, last thing at night. For some reason, hit 8 p.m. and I just get this boost in productivity. So I now block out those time. And this is where we go with that structure equals freedom. Is that yeah, yeah. It's blocked out, it's in the diary. You message me and you're like, okay, can you do a podcast tomorrow? Yeah, cool, can you do 2 p.m.? Because I know that I've got 2 p.m. free. Yeah, and so. it's not something that's like a direct like you've got replies to certain people is a freedom thing that helps you with your business and also you know, gives you some that kind of social side of it that you want exactly in your life. exactly the other the other speaking of social actually the other big thing that's that's tough um if you do transition into an online only business uh, i'll just be honest with this is it's, it can be really lonely hmm. um you know go from being on a gym floor for like 12 16 hours a day for over a decade having colleagues to bounce off of, having different you know, in-person clients you build rapport with, to suddenly being stuck behind a laptop screen. It's, yeah, it takes some ad uh, some adapting to. And this is where you have to factor in, as I said, book in your personal fulfillment. Book in catch-ups with your friends, book in date night, book in cinema visits. Just it's important. Freedom to actually feel like you're stepping away from it otherwise you do just get otherwise it's, you just go into hermit mode you know you just keep telling yourself right, i gotta work i gotta work i'm building a business here and yeah you do have to put the hours in to get it off the ground but not at the expense of you know no. personal life no never should do what's the uh, biggest benefit you see over doing a photo shoot compared to actually stepping on stage easily it's the fact that you have uh, an end date and you have accountability but without the pressure of being compared to other people that's the big thing. So when I have people come to me with very soft goals of, I wanna get fitter or I wanna lose weight, um, the first thing I try and do is define, you know, how much weight do you wanna lose and what's your definition of getting fitter? Um, whereas it, when, when you have soft goals in places, there's, it's tough to get that grip between your teeth and to work hard towards it, you know, you, you coast. Yeah. Whereas as soon as you go, no, we're gonna to shoot to lose 12 pounds in X amount of time, suddenly there's a little bit of, you've upped the ante a little bit, there's some more accountability. 
in the the clients that I then get them from sort of beginners to to the intermediate stage, it's then great to be able to say to them, let's level this up again. Let's pick a date in the diary. Let's speak to Ben and let's do a photo shoot. So you can, you've got those photos to look back on. The cool thing with that is it gives us that end date. It gives us that accountability. Um, but without just the, the psychological uh, negatives of being stood on stage, knowing that you've got, you know, six, seven judges in front of you, comparing you to the, the guy or girl next to you, um, which for somebody like myself, I've competed. Um, I got into competing, we can go through this in a minute, but I got into competing for what I considered to be the right reasons. So I'm able to take that uh, constructive criticism uh, with, with no issues. It doesn't sit on my mind afterwards. You know, a judge could say to me, okay, you need to thicken your upper chest or you need bigger biceps, you need better hamstrings or so on. I can take those. Okay, great. I know what I'm doing for the next 12 months in the gym. Whereas um, you give that same scenario to perhaps a maybe a female that has been bullied when she was at school for being overweight she's now feeling fantastic about herself she decides to compete she's now stood on stage in her underwear and she has a judge say you've got too much fat on your ass that's a yeah, tough one right uh, so it depends on where you're at uh, the great thing about a photo shoot is it's you versus you um, you you don't have to be as lean as a competition, although you can choose to. But if you're dieting, 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 and then you hit that mental roadblock, you know, hormonally things start shifting, psychologically things get tough. When it comes to a photo shoot, you can take your foot off the gas a little bit if you want. Um, I do have some clients that just go full bore ahead and, and they're good mentally to keep going. But for some, for, for some clients where the going gets tough, you're able to pull back a little bit. With a competition, you can't do that uh, because it's a competition um it, you know it's, it's in the name uh, was with the photo shoot it's you versus you you decide how lean you want to get and then it's up to you that once you've done the photo shoot you might look at it you might look at your photos get them back and go okay i look amazing here the best i've ever looked but next time i want slightly more rounded shoulders or i want to come in a little bit tighter through my midsection and the difference is that it's you making that call rather than a panel of people that know nothing about you, know nothing about your past, telling you that you need to use it. Um, I think this mainly comes down to, it's over the last few years, it's the rise of Instagram, which has it's got its positives and its negatives, as we know, which is a whole different subject. Um, but for example, for me, when I competed, it was, I already loved training. I already enjoyed the, the dieting mindset. I could no longer compete in football, rugby, and so on. So the next logical step for me to, to kind of have that competitive element was bodybuilding. Like it was a natural evolution of, I already enjoyed training and nutrition as a foundation, and this was just leveling up and taking it to the extreme. Whereas I've had girls that have messaged me, and I, I, I only say girls because this is, I find it more common amongst the bikini competitors where I've had a girl message me and say, hey, would you mind coaching me for a competition? I'm going to compete in April. You know, it's now, say, January. And when I say to them, okay, can you send me over sort of your current training and nutrition? They say, oh, I haven't trained yet. I'm like, huh, what? Like, oh, I don't train. Like, I've just, you know, I've seen it on Instagram. I want to do it. You're doing it for the wrong reasons. Like, you need to have a love for training and nutrition. Otherwise, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. You're doing it for, you know, the likes and the dopamine hit that you're going to get from Instagram and, your, you know, your Insta fame. And that can only carry you so far. When you hit that last three to six weeks where you've really got to grind hard to get, you know, glutes and hamstrings through and so on, it, it, having that, you know, want to do it for... Basically, you're doing it for, like, external gratification. Mm -hmm. You don't to please other people rather than yourself. And that's only going to carry you so far. And this is where I see then binge eating leads in, people skip training sessions, they resent it. And these are the goals that typically, and it does happen with guys too, but more so with females, where they'll compete, they'll end up with a real negative mindset post-show, binge eating disorder and negative body image, and they'll blame it on competing. And, you know, competing's bad, you shouldn't do it, blah, blah. It's like, no, it's just, you were doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah, yeah. It's an extreme sport, it is tough. Um, but if you have a love for training nutrition as the foundation, and this is the cherry on top of the cake, 
that enables you to grit your teeth when the going gets tough. As I said, because because it's an internal driver. Whereas if you're doing it, try and please other people. I.e., Instagram, it's it's external. It's only going to carry you so far. And that, I suppose the other great thing about photo shoots is like you can change it up a bit. Like you know, if you're on a shoot, you can kind of go. Actually, I want to be a bit more girls like maybe a bit more sassy or like I want to yeah. be strong. Whereas but you're on stage, you've just got that one. It's that thing. one you're look. Literally it's... that one look you've got. To then and also if you're someone that does compare yourself to others and takes it like kind of a hard way you're going to stand up next to possibly like seven ten other girls who have either done it before mm -hmm. or they haven't but you're going to look at them and go oh her shoulders look amazing oh her bum looks great it's not as good as mine and that instantly can put you in such a terrible place yeah again it's that comparison um coming in and the thing that you have to bear in mind with competing is that yeah it's nice to win but uh, the, the two elements to it that people I think they forget or they never really think about, one is it's subjective. So by that I mean, if you think of a football match, when the ball crosses the line, it's a goal. It is what it is. You know, if it's been backed up by a video referee or whatever, it's, as long as the ball's crossed the line, it's, it's a goal. Whereas your version of what looks great and my version could be two different things. Yeah, yeah. We could have five girls in front of us or five guys, you know, whatever, male, female, competitors sat in front of us, we could both be there on the judging panel, you and I, and I could go, I think that guy there deserves to win. And you go, oh no, actually, I prefer the structure of this dude. It's, it's subjective. Um, and then the other side of it is that largely it's also down to genetics. So there has to be a winner, there has to be a loser, um, and you can't control who turns up on the day. So my goal going into every show is always like, okay, yeah, I'd like to win. But as long as I can stand there with my head held high, I can look to the person to my left, look to the person to my right, and know that they didn't outwork me. If they beat me, it's because just genetically they picked better parents than I did. <laughs> um, that, you know, I didn't cheat on my diet, I didn't skip a cardio session, I didn't pussy out in the gym. That, that's my, my driving, that's my big goal. Outside of that, it's, it's down to genetics. Um, but, but people don't account for this. You get people that have never competed before and they'll hire me and they'll say, do you think I can win it? And it's like, well, we can do the best that we can do, but I don't know, like, it'd yeah, be nice. Of course, as a coach, I want you to win, but I'm not gonna fill your head with false hope because you could look epic. Uh, and you'll see it time and time again where girls and guys will put photos uh, of them, you know, in the gym in great down lighting, post uh, training sessions, they've got a good pump on, looking phenomenal, that's on their own. Then you put them in a lineup with people that are, you know, genetically superior, and suddenly you you fade to the back. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but again, it's just that psychological side of it. Can you can you take that? Like, you should be able to look at them and go, okay, yeah, I worked really hard for this, but ultimately that person just looks better than me. You just got to take that. And it is what it yeah, is. Yeah, like yeah. I can't control it. Right. Another. I read a lot of books. I've I've learned that reading books has actually opened my eyes up to a lot more that I didn't know mm -hmm. um, and it's taught me a lot more um, some of the books that have impacted me the most have been The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and also The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck which was something that I never thought I'd ever read um, but it actually really re made me realise how much you take in off of other people's comments and when you're actually doing your own thing what books have you read that you would recommend to people that really like changed your mind on how you think about life? Okay um, I would say, I'm going to give a few, um, I would say one of them is uh, a book that Akash gave me a few years ago and I actually ended up sending a copy of it to everybody on my mentorship which is called The One Thing and uh, the name of it kind of gives it away. Basically the whole premise of this is you can carry it over with, with any aspect of life but for me it was more I've been applying it to business is it's easy to start getting the wheels in motion on a project and then get that kind of you know, shiny object syndrome where you start looking at, oh, can I implement this? Can I implement Before you really nail down on the, the big task that matters. So the one thing is a great book to read when you start getting really overwhelmed in your business. You have so many ideas on and you just need reaffirming to come back to the, the one thing that's going to push the needle forwards. So that's a really good one for, as I said, business and life in general. When things are getting too much, you've got so many things on your plate and you just need to kind of bring it back. Uh, the one thing. Uh, this one might interest you actually. Uh, this might surprise you even. Uh, it, from a relationship point of view, 
if people are struggling like in their relationships there's a book called um, The Five Love Languages I don't know if you've heard of this one at all I think you've, we've spoken about this I before but yeah, yeah, yeah. so super interesting reads where um, again the, the premise behind this is that everybody has a different what they call love language so how they interpret like being in a relationship the, 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 how they respond to like their their partner's love sounds really weird but basically for some people it could be like receiving gifts for some people it could be acts of service like cleaning it could be words of affirmation it can be touch and so on um and everybody usually is sort of slightly different wavelengths so you could be in a relationship with somebody and you've gone and cleaned the whole house and you think that's amazing you've just done this huge favor for them but their love language isn't acts of service so for them they'll come home and it's just like, oh cool you did that for me thanks and then you're like, well, you know, why aren't you appreciating this? Um, so it's, it's a really good book to read just so you can start to see traits. And it, you take it away from um, just, you know, your romantic relationship. And you can apply it with like, friendships and like business partnerships. And you you can work out. You, it's, it's just a cool it's a little like psychology hack. You can work out, okay, is the person that I'm trying to, you know, build rapport with, are they more words of affirmation or are they this or that? So anyway, that's a really good book, uh, The Five Love Languages. It's funny you say that actually, because like my partner Jade, who will probably watch this and listen to this, like she's like, every time I come back from being away, like the house is immaculate and she's done it because she wants to show like, you know, she'd take full pride yeah. and care of it. And I suppose just literally thinking there then, I was like, wow, like, yeah, she does that because that's her way of showing that she cares yeah, exactly. and she loves. And my way, I'm often in a, in a professional let's say way or like you know maybe with her like more hands on I'm more like a physical like yeah. in front of people and that's like the way I show what I do when I'm there so it's quite interesting you say that because I've never really put two and two together but now just saying well, that well what's interesting is because like if you're if when you come home and she's done all that and you're kind of like okay cool this is this is cool but it doesn't blow you away then it means that that's not necessarily like your love language yours might be as you say the touch so how you can then apply it is that naturally I doubt that you think of doing the small things like cleaning up and moving this to here and that to there. What are you trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Yeah. <laughs> but if you start then, if you understand that your partner's love language is this, then you can start thinking, okay, you know what? Usually I wouldn't empty the fucking dishwasher, but just to keep the peace, I'm going to do it. Um, it's, it's, it's funny. Like my, one of my other friends, Adam, uh, his, so, again generalizing it's rare that i've come across many guys where their love language would be acts of service but he is 100 percent one of them because every time i meet him whenever i say oh how's it going with his partner it's always like oh yeah it's good but she you know she just left the washing out she did this and it's really bizarre but it's clearly where she doesn't match up on that you know and it, yeah, it's, it's really weird. It, it, it's interesting. It's a really good read. Um, like straight away, I know that for me, mine's words of affirmation. So you can clean for me, you can do all this. And I'm like, okay, cool. There's another one that's obviously like gifts. Um, and again, if somebody buys me a gift, it's like, oh, awesome. For me, it's just words of affirmation. If somebody says to me, You're looking tall today. Yeah, fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> somebody says that, I'm on cloud nine for the next three weeks. Uh, no, it's it's exactly that. Somebody pays a compliment. Oh, your work was really good. The content you put out was good. Or you know, when you're, when you're in a relationship, it's oh, I miss you. Or just those cheesy, those little a single sentence in a text, and I'm elevated for the day. Whereas if somebody else isn't that love language, it would fall on deaf ears. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, for example, Jade, for example, if her love language is the acts of service, you could say to her, "You look amazing today. You do this. You do that. Whatever." To, what you think is the right thing and it just won't resonate whereas if you go and do the ironing that's suddenly yeah is anyway we got off on a tangent there but it's a really good book um the last two books the first one would be the the one thing uh, more for business second one would be just just relationships in general not necessarily romantic would be uh, the five love languages and then for trainers that presumably you know you work with a lot of fitness people are going to be listening to this i think to be a good trainer um, the top two books that I would recommend would be Lyle McDonald's Rapid Fat Loss Handbook and then also Lyle McDonald's Guide to Flexible Dieting. So I think trainers are either pigeonholed into being too extreme um, and always just putting their client through through brutal diets and they never know the happy medium or they're too lenient on their clients and they never know where to grind them 
Whereas if you can read both of these books and learn when to apply which which one, you're going to get 10 times better results for your clients. And that's what, that's what a great thing about books, isn't it? That they open your mind up to so many different things and you go, actually, now I can achieve those results because I just didn't see or know that that was what that person was doing. Or exactly. Understanding people is a massive thing about business because that's kind of how you win and you, you know you make them sales or not. If you understand someone, you can do the right thing. Psychology to, is yeah. huge. Yeah, if we're talking psychology, another couple of books. Um, one is called Quiet, uh, which is written purely about introverts. Um, and how introverts can excel in what the author terms as an extroverted world. Um, and then the other one would be um, Never Eat Alone, which is a good one. Okay. Well, you don't need that one. No, <laughs> I'll talk to everyone. You don't need that one, you talk to everyone. <laughs> right, uh, last question on my list to hit. Um, so tell me about your uh, the achievement you're most proud of. Oh man, okay. So on a physical level, it would be winning my last bodybuilding show in my class and the overall which was cool uh, and unexpected on a mental uh, the deeper level would be having the balls to leave full-time employment and set up a self-employed business it's a, um, a hard one isn't it? it's hard like all of my family and pretty much all of my friends um, are all employed by by other businesses um, and I'd always kind of had this like you know, this little pipe dream that one day I could run my own business. And I was doing online coaching for years. And I remember one of my ex colleagues in London, Nick Daniel saying to me, like, you'd love, wouldn't you just to work remotely from a laptop? And I was like, yeah, like, I really like the idea of that. But again, it was just kind of one of these afterthoughts. So to have the balls to eventually actually take action and make it happen. And, and ultimately for it to be, you know, two years later, it's, still a reality and it's, it's going Success. from strength to strength um it's probably my, my biggest accomplishment is having the balls to do it and then following through and making it succeed it's, it's um it's such a for me like it was hard to go through that they say like family friends they just don't understand they don't understand it. it like why why would you take this risk I, the amount of people i tell them i'm a fitness photographer and they go is there a market for that yeah and you're like well yeah if you walk outside of your desk job <laughs> And look it around and you see how many thousands of people go to the gym every single day. Yeah. Like, yeah, this was something I was talking to someone about the other day. Um, like, for me to get enough work, let's just say with my following alone, that I've only got 4,000 something. Mm -hmm. If I got, what is it, 1% of that book me for work, yeah. that's nearly enough to pay the mortgage for the year. And like it's crazy to think like that, but that's true. You know, yeah. so you can if you can get that to five percent or ten percent, you know, you're going to be so. Busy. It's realistic when you reverse engineer it. So this is a a tool that I did with the guys on my mentorship in one of the webinars. Was you know I spoke about the fact that you go on Facebook and you'll see these ads keep popping up of these gurus telling you you can build a six figure business and so on. The problem is now when people hear the word like six figure business, you think like slimy car salesman or whatever. Whereas I did the math on it um, and reverse engineered it for them that I, I can't remember the math off the top of my head, but I just said, right, as a trainer, if you want to earn 100 grand over the year, divide that back by 12. It's about eight and a half thousand pounds per month that you need. If you're charging 125 pounds a month, I think this was the figure I gave. If you're charging 125 pounds a month, that means you just need 65 clients. If you're charging 150 a month, it means you just need 55 clients. It's really not that hard if you set the systems up in place and you can retain people to work on 55 clients. Yeah. But they'd never looked at it like that. It was always just, you know. You just see that big figure and think, how are you going to get How are you going to ever get yeah. there? And how are you going to. It's just like, just think of it logically. Just work it backwards. Okay, this is what I want to earn at the year. Break it down per month. How much can I get away with charging per month? Uh, and am I worth it? And then how many clients do I need to make that happen? And it might not happen overnight, but it's certainly possible. And um, that you've got to give yourself time as well. Like, and that's the, that's the probably the hardest bit I found is actually like, you sit and think I need to make money. How long is it going to take me to make that money? Yeah. And then once I do with that, like I got to a point recently where I was looking, going, well, once I earn all this money, what am I going to? How am I going to do it? What am I going to mm -hmm. do with it? And you're suddenly thinking, this wasn't Find a problem. This, <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't a problem I was going to have two years ago because I was nowhere near that type of figure. Yeah. So, th this is uh, something uh, Vince Del Monte always says, is you'll you'll create new problems the bigger your business gets and the more like what troubled you at the beginning you won't even it's an afterthought and you you you'll keep coming up to new 
bigger problems because everything's evolving and the scale is getting bigger and it's that's where you do your growing like it's and that's it's exciting exactly and that's what that's the positive side of it isn't it mm. to then know that they're that your next things that you got what am i going to spend my money what am i going to spend my money on? Yeah, yeah yeah right so we're just going to go with free quick fire uh -huh. nice way to finish it right so tell us the three things most people wouldn't know about you oh three things most people wouldn't know about me that i used to dj um so i used to dj Kevin and perry <laughs> Tra it was trance music Kevin and Perry's what got me into DJ no. seriously yeah oh, I watched wow. Kevin and Perry when I was I, I think it came out in like 1998 or 1999 so I was like 8 or 9 years old I watched it I bought the album Big Girl um, and I just loved trance music uh, from that era like 1999 uh, like Ayla Ayla and all that sort of stuff um, so that's my, number one that I used to DJ and it was Kevin and Perry that got me into it like legit it was <laughs> Um, number two is let's go along the same theme is that um, I've actually got music on iTunes that you can buy so I also produced trance music uh, and one of the tracks called Morning Breeze got to number eight in the worldwide trance charts wow. which not many people know right. um, what would be number three number three would probably be I'm trying to think here what don't people know about me I would talk about like the old fashions and steak, but I think that's quite obvious if you follow me on Instagram. Um, maybe just uh, right now, my big passion is self-development. Um, so naturally, like, business is a passion because it's kind of how I make my living now. Um, but I like to think that from like a, a, just a progression point of view, that the previous decade was all about physical improvement how can I improve my body? How can I compete? How can I do this? Now it's more like mindset, you know, how can I be more productive? How can I hold a conversation with people better? How can I build better relationships? And yeah, so that's maybe something that people just, on the face of it, when you see a trainer, like I get it when I go on dates and people are like, oh, like, you're not a stereotypical meathead trainer. You know, no. your conversation is a little bit different and out there. Um, so maybe it's that that right now is, Something I love reading about and, and trying yeah, to find out more psychology and self development. Right. So you've just won a hundred million pounds on the lottery. What's the first three things you walk out and buy? Oh man, that's a it's a really tough one. Um, okay, first thing would be an Aston Martin one seven seven, um, and that's Alice. because I love Aston Martins. What it was since I was a kid. The one seven seven, for those that don't know, is that they were only seventy seven built. Um, there's actually only 76 in the world now because somebody wrote one off in Hong Kong uh, they originally went for about a million pounds and now I think they're probably about 2.2 .2 million pounds so and it would be, it would be my, my client Rob uh, Rob Groves that put me he showed me a photo of one uh, then I watched a whole documentary on how they were made and it's really impressive uh, so it would be an Aston Martin 177 yep. three other, two other oh things. I got two other things oh shit um, okay number two I think it would have to be like a big bastard house. Um, Are you talking multiple rooms or something like a nice view and a small? No, if you've got multiple rooms, and it automatically implies that people can come and stay. <laughs> <laughs> Which don't want no one to visit me. I just want some nice place. I just want somewhere nice. Uh, I'd like a home gym. Probably wouldn't even use it, but I'd like a home gym. Um, yeah, so it would be a big place. And then the third one. Million pounds. See, I'm trying to think huge now with a million pounds. It's like if you'd said million. to me, "Are oh, you gonna?" Oh, sorry, hundred million. If you'd said to me, like, you know, you've a couple grand, then it's actually a bit easier because it's like, oh, there's a new pair of shoes I wouldn't mind, or isn't it? But when you're talking hundred million, it's like fucking next level money. Um, it would have to be super pretentious, and if you're on, if you've got that much money, hundred million, it'd be a private jet. It'd be a private jet, that. and Aston Martin one seven seven, and uh, a big house but with not many rooms <laughs> <laughs> right. basically just one massive master bedroom yeah yeah just with an amazing view That's yeah it. um you like to travel i know you obviously try and get on a plane as much as you can where would you where is next on your list of places to go okay so next realistically will be in two weeks i might be looking at going to colorado to do a biomechanics course um so sort of be the u.s but I've been there quite a few times. If you're talking like next, Holiday. as in 
oh, I don't really like holidays. Um, <laughs> don't really like holidays. I just love well, the last one. I do. The last one I went on, I was just bored shitless. I don't like holidays as in um, sitting down doing nothing. Uh, so, I would say something that I've always wanted to do, haven't got around to doing yet, would be Iceland or Finland for the Northern Lights. Okay. That would be what I would like to do next. If we're talking like work aside, not just not work related travel. Go and see, um, yeah, just Boston's switch amazing. off. Yeah, I'd love to do Iceland or Finland for Perfect. the Northern Lights. Well, thank you very much for your time today. No problem. And uh, it was good. Hope you enjoy the insights into Mr. Adam Haley. And uh, yes, hopefully you'll tune back in next week and hear the next podcast. Uh, so that's from me, uh, Ben, and yes, over and out.